we are here today, May 29th, 2018, at the home of Lawrence Abrams in New York City. And we're going to speak with Mr. Abrams um, about the American fashion designer, Norman Norell. I didn't introduce myself. My name is April Callahan. I'm a curator of manuscript collections at FIT Library Special Collections. Um, Norell has been called the quote unquote American Balenciaga. Mm -hmm. um, and about him, recently the American fashion designer Ralph Rucci remarked that he was, quote, a magic engineer masquerading as a fashion designer. So one of the things that Norell is best known for is both his precision and his unfaltering dedication to fit. So Mr. Abrams, can you please tell us how did you come to know Norman Norell? Well, as in the previous uh, tape you did on my mother fashion designer Miriam Abrams, in the beginning of her career, in the early 30s, she worked with Norrell at Hattie Carnegie, and she had quite an influence on him. She used to wear, for evening wear, pleated silk shirts and long journal skirts, and she designed the same thing, and he picked that up and carried it on throughout his career. Also, she used to wear the blouses under a suit jacket or just with a plain skirt, which in those days was unheard of. Uh, so up until his death, my mother was close to him, and as a child, I knew him. We used to go to his house, first on 80, East 81st Street, and then when he moved to Amster Yard um, on 47th Street. He used to come to our home. Uh, we used to eat with him at Hamburger Heaven on Madison <laughs> Avenue in 66th Street. They had the best uh, relish <laughs> and apple crumb pie. Um, and my mother was invited always to his uh, shows, and I went to quite a few, and I was designing as a little kid, and uh, he took an interest in me like he did later on with when he was teaching at Parsons mm -hmm. students. Uh, I used to submit sketches to him, he used them from time to time, and we were quite close. So I was more interested, not in his designing, but in his construction, mm -hmm. which to me sets him apart from any other American designer. Right. Um, can you expand on that a little bit further? And like, what are some of the particular hallmarks of Norell's work, besides, of course, his dedication to construction? Uh, well, I've already planned okay. in my way, so I think it's a little easier than Perfect. answering your question. It'll be answered. Great. Uh, uh, in 2016, the beginning of uh, March, a friend of mine uh, told me that she knew someone that was planning to write a, a book on Norrell, and I always believed that he deserved like a Balenciaga or a Dior to be written because there was no one in American design even to this day that came near to what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said I'd be more than happy to meet them and since she knew that I had known him, I was introduced to um, uh, these people that were writing the book and uh, they were taping me and I said, look, it's much easier if I write <laughs> than speaking. So in the beginning of, for two weeks in March, I wrote a manuscript of 120, 30 pages, which I ultimately gave to them. And we were supposed to work together on it, which we didn't do, but they did use in their book uh, basically everything that I told them about him and his uh, construction. Mm -hmm. um, and that's basically how then I gave to you the manuscript and all the uh, information that I had on Norrell. Also what I had written, which they didn't use, I thought it was much more interesting to use his own words than just telling a story. Because in my collection of articles and things, I have all kinds of quotes that he express which is much more informative than anyone could reinterpret or try to put on to him. And that's uh, what I did. So I have uh, seven chapters. I started off the book with his obituary in 1972. Then I went to the retrospect of 50 years of his creations. And then I went on to a biography from 1900, his birth, to 1960 when he went into his own business. 
then I did what I call the most important part of the manuscript, what makes Norel Close so special and his models then a review of his collections from 1960 till his death in 72, then a section on uh, his clients, show business, socialites, and just wealthy women, and then his homes, because he was a collector of uh, fine French furniture and also oriental uh, art. And then I had a chronology. Um, n well, I guess I'll skip the... Uh, what I will show you, just before he died uh, in November of 72, uh, at the opening of the museum exhibition, you will see on the left side one of his last dresses, a crepe dress with mock diamond buttons. The woman standing next to him bought a dress 40 years earlier, and you will see it's almost identical. What Norell did do, and some people criticized him, was that he kept making the same clothes. What he did do is he had favorite bodies and he reworked them over time, updating them and perfecting the construction, the fit, and his clientele didn't care because every time he updated it, it did look different and it was more modern than what he did, say, 10 or 15 years earlier. Uh, at the exhibition uh, at the Metropolitan Museum, a lot of people in show business gave clothing uh, on loan. There was also a fashion show, a modeling of his clothes over the years. One of the big contributors was singer Dinah Shore. And you'll see she's sitting here, both she's wearing Norell's. Also a big contributor was Lauren Bacall mm -hmm. who uh, wore his clothes in the 60s exclusively and uh, she had been wearing her clo his clothes, she used to buy them when she was young and just starting as a model uh, at Lowman's in Brooklyn. Uh, and then when she started to be successful she was able to purchase his clothes and uh, she was a very good friend of his. Uh, also, there were a number of uh, wealthy women, unknown, who were big collectors of, her clothes, of his clothes. One woman uh, lived in Boston. She had 150 outfits in her home, 400 in storage. Wow. And she gave a tremendous amount. So the women that wore his clothes from the well, the 30s when he worked for Hattie Carnegie were mostly custom-made things and he did a lot f uh, for show business for Constance Bennett, Loretta Young, Joan Crawford, and a number of other um, um, actresses and some for socialites, but mostly he developed a following of uh, so, uh, people in show business and they wore his clothes in their movies. Mm -hmm. Uh, later, Lauren Bacall wore, in many of her movies, her own personal wardrobe, as did, um, uh, what do you call it, um, A Touch of Mink with Cary Grant and Doris Day. Cary Grant selected the clothes from Norell's showroom for her, and then she became a fan of his clothes. And Lee Remick did a movie um, where Norell designed, well basically they took what was in season, which was a spring season uh, selection, but it was the only movie he really worked from top to bottom, all the accessories, and there were a lot of other movies that actresses did wear mm -hmm. his uh, clothing. He had a very dedicated customer base. Very dedicated, and his sell-through was tremendous, and that was predominantly due to the, the fit. Mm -hmm. Once a woman put on his clothes, they were hooked. Right. Um, now, uh, we'll skip that. His early life. Norell was born in April 1900. His father was Harry M. Levine, who he passed away in 1930. His mother was Nettie, and she lived until 1962 at, and was 95 years of age. Norell had a brother, Frank, 
who carried on the father's business and by the early 70s had expanded to a number of stores, uh, menswear. Now, Norell uh, originally, when his father went into business, he uh, went into the men's hatwear business. And a cheap hat cost one dollar, an expensive hat cost three dollars. So he decided to go in the middle at two dollars. <laughs> um, what was also done, he used to advertise in burlesque uh, playbills mm -hmm. and they would receive free tickets to go to see the show. So at a very early age, Norrell was going to burlesque shows and he was taken by the costume, the sequined costumes that the women were wearing. And this was an influence that lasted throughout his career. His famous mermaid gowns originated with what he saw as a child. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, the first outfit he ever uh, created was for his mother in 1920. They were taking a train trip to California, which took five days. He designed a red chiffon dress to the floor, a big straw hat with flowing black ribbons, and a lace-trimmed parasol. And Norell said that uh, nobody in the entire trip spoke to them because they thought they were Bessarabian gypsies. <laughs> but as you can see, even at the a, uh, at 20, he was, his desire was to be a designer. Um, Norell was not especially a especially good student and he didn't really want to go to college, so he told his parents he wanted to go to art school. So his father brought him to New York at the age of 18 and he entered Parsons. Mm -hmm where in those days there was no fashion designing courses. Uh, so after one year he transferred to Pratt, where also he studied uh, drawing, but his professors left him alone and he did his own studying on costume and the history of fashion. And what changed his life at that point, he entered a blouse contest, he won first prize and a hundred dollars. Uh, after graduation, he went on at the age of 22 to Brooks Costumes in New York and he created towering headdresses and flowing uh, gowns for burlesque uh, chorus girls. He then went to Paramount Pictures where he, in Astoria where he was assigned to design costumes for a Valentino movie and a Gloria Swanson movie. He was wildly successful right off the bat, pretty much uh, right out of school. He was already yeah, and he for was major Hollywood stars. yeah. Well, cut, uh, for the sh movies, yeah. really, and, and not total uh, wardrobes, just bits and pieces. But in the Valentino um, movie, he did uh, for Valentino uh, a shirt with voluminous shirt sleeves, and this was something that he carried out for the rest of his career for his own lines. Mm -hmm. Now, what I have here is from 1922. These are sketches he did. If you look, you'll see Feathers oh, yes. gown. This, was an inf this is before he was designing ready-to-wear for women. This was costumes, but he had a love already for feathers. Also, you'll see a chemise, right. because in the 20s, chemises were the what women wore, waistless dresses. You'll see a chemise and at the bottom beading. He did the same thing through the 60s until he died where he would do a jersey dress and he would do beading on it. Mock diamonds or if he did a dress in shocking pink he'd do uh, mock diamonds in pink. Right. So that was an influence. He also did very tailored suiting which again he did throughout his career and his most original collection he did when he discarded his line in the 60s he wanted to do something that was not influenced by Paris or anything else so he really went back to the, his favorite period the 1920s where he would do a jacket which would be based on a man's cardigan mm -hmm. and again at that point Norell 
was known for heavily, in those days, constructed suiting. But with this line, no linings, mm -hmm. no dots. I mean, very, very lightweight, unlike what was being made at the time and what he was also known for. Also, Norell loved tapes, as you'll see. And throughout his career, short capes, medium length capes, long capes, mink line capes were a major part of his collections. As I said, he did keep updating them, even though uh, they were basically the same idea. Uh, after uh, what he called uh, designing atrocious costumes, <laughs> He, uh, he also did two, um, uh, he did some costumes for Ziegfeld Follies. Mm -hmm. The only time he ever got credit, he did a group of costumes for the Cotton Club up in Harlem, and they used his name. Uh, he said he designed the most vulgar junk you have ever seen. He then went to uh, 7th Avenue, and his first job was for, with Charles Armour where he remained for three years, and this is where he got his basic training in designing clothes for the average woman. In 1927, he went to Hattie Carnegie, which was a, the Bergdorf's of its day, and he was given a two-week trial to see what he could do, and he designed a um, green coat with an enormous lynx collar and an oversized hot hat, which he thought was atrocious, but it sold, and he remained with her for 13 years. Now, what he had learned at Armour was ready to wear, mass production, and how to design clothes that were wearable. At Hattie Carnegie, he did design for a lot of people in show business, and a lot of the clothes were theatrical for whatever the role was, but he also designed for wealthy women, mm -hmm. such as I showed you the one with the mock diamonds down the side, which were uh, for the average woman that was wearable, but that wasn't theatrical. Uh, at Hattie Carnegie, he learned couture dressmaking. Hattie would buy as many as 200 couture models each season in Paris, bring them back, they would take the clothes apart to see how they were constructed, to see the styles, and this is where he learned true couture construction, which he continued to do when he went uh, on to do ready to wear as trainer Norell and when he went into his own business as Norman Norell. Uh, Hattie Carnegie in uh, 1940, he was designing a costume for Gertrude Lawrence, one of her Broadway shows, The Lady in the Dark. He designed a tulle gown, full skirted to the floor, strapless, uh, with sequins and ostrich feathers. Hattie Carnegie, Carnegie thought it was too flamboyant. They had an argument and he was fired. And so in 1941, a year later, he was interviewed by Anthony Trainer, who was a better manufacturer on 7th Avenue and was accepted for the job. And he was given the opportunity to earn a lot of money or to put his name on the label. And he chose to put his name on the label. At this time, he engaged Eleanor Lambert, who was a PR woman to do his public relations, which this was very early. Yes. The only other person mm -hmm. that did this was Adrian, who worked in Hollywood, and he also engaged Eleanor Lambert. Um, Norell, Eleanor Lambert started the Cody Awards, where they would uh, give prizes. There would be a panel, and she'd be in charge to design us each year. So in 1943 and 1951, he won a Cody Award. And in uh, 1956, he entered the Hall of Fame, meaning he, he hit the top. That was it. Uh, at Anthony Trainer, Norell learned about mass production. 
and what he had learned at uh, Carnegie, the couture, he combined the two and he was set for life which also set him apart from other designers and this he went on his own path uh, as a designer. Now uh, came the Second World War and there was no more seeing what was being created in Paris and American desi designers were now having to do their own designing without being able to copy. Up until this time uh, most designers with copying what was made in Paris. Uh, he, in 1941, started uh, his first collection, which was a smash hit, and he was on his, row, uh, on his way to fame and f for the rest of his career. Um, I gave the Metropol uh, <laughs> Metro no, I gave to FIT uh, one of my mother's uh, evening gowns, 1941, a red silk sura pleated blouse mm -hmm. and a black taffeta skirt to the floor. It originally had a purple come up on, but it's in your collection. Uh, also, uh, in the early 50s, uh, I gave a um, brown chiffon pleated and tucked blouse with a pleated skirt of Staron silk and a leather belt. Mm -hmm. Also with it, uh, a uh, navy uh, um, um, blouse that's all pleated with mock diamond studs and also studs that were gold knots. Uh, again, same thing, carrying on the same theme. Here's a picture uh, from 1953. Norel, for the first time, used sari fabrics. He did dresses, but he also did, again, skirts. the, the journal skirts with pleated blouses. Beautiful. Again, uh, as you will see, throughout the career, he kept doing the same things over and over, but changing them as time went on. So he continued to riff on a the theme. Yeah. Uh, again, this he had certain bodies. He loved sailor suits. So he did from the 30s on sailor dresses. He loved, um, again, separates in the blouses and skirts. He did them for day. He did them for evening. He uh, did uh, coats that he made throughout his career this basically the same bodies, just changing collars, changing uh, silhouettes slightly, but very tailored. Same thing with bolero suits. He did boleros from the 1940s on. Uh, here's a suit from 1950. Four. It's a velvet, black velvet suit mm -hmm. with a pleated blouse, a cummerbund, and the lace trim collar. Uh, what he did later is he would do the same thing instead of uh, a slim skirt, he did a dirndl skirt. Or he would do a gore, later his big collection, he did a, a, a 14 gore skirt. 15 yards of fabric wow. belted. But the same idea, is, again, he reworked a theme mm -hmm. over and over. Here's 1960. He loved jumpers. He did these from, for um, Trainer Norrell. They were very popular. Oh, yeah. 1953. They retailed for un a little under $300 at the time. Here, 1961, you will see a sequined jumper with a voluminous sleeve of organdy. Again, this was the sleeve he designed for Valentino in the 20s. Another thing that he loved was Ampere. Yes. And throughout his career, he did Ampere gowns. I also gave one of my mothers from 63 uh, a... Um, uh, gold lame 
uh, Ampere gown with a short sleeve and on the edge of the sleeve he had a fringe of bu gold bugle beads mm -hmm. and at the hem five rows of fringed bugle beads. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, I have a picture I'll show later. Again, uh, season after season uh, at um, Trena, he reworked the same themes. Here you'll have a lace, cape, and dress. Again, he would go on to make the same thing for the daytime. Again, here's a short wow. beautiful cape, tailoring. beautiful tailoring. And again, he would put either a blouse or, as in this case, a one-piece dress. Mm -hmm. Difference, the silhouettes would more fitted, then they'd become more loose, but he would adapt as fashion changed, but it was really the same yeah. theme over and over. So if you could pause for a moment, I should have changed the battery. Okay, good. And now I'm, in, I'm all over the place. <laughs> Let's, let's see, did I leave anything out, really? <laughs> okay, I didn't do that. Um, I, recording again. Okay. Um, in 1941, uh, at uh, Train and he revived the chemise dress. Again, this was something that he would keep making until his death, and it was always his number one seller, and he basically l did them in wovens, but mostly in knits. And um, they were his number one sellers throughout his career. Uh, also at Trainer, he did sailor dresses, jumpers, beautifully tailored suits, and um, beautiful, his mermaid evening gowns. Again, here from Ninth Vogue magazine, 1953, is a sketch of one of his dresses from the early 40s, the chemise. Now, Balenciaga, in 1957, uh, revived the chemise, but Norell had been doing it every season, years before. Again, 53, mm -hmm. a cape with a, a costume, a dress under it. A chemise, pr silk print, but he had it attached like a capelet in the back. Fifty-three. This is very influenced by Balenciaga, and this he got criticism for, and he admitted later on that he was too influenced by Balenciaga. If you look at Balenciagas from this period, you would say this is a Balenciaga. Especially in that use of lace. Yeah. Here's one of his little tailored Bolero suits from 53. During the war, as I said, Lord and Taylor became his best client. They promoted American designers. They were the very first store to give credit to designers. Here's a chemise, mm -hmm. self-sashed, but you could wear it loose. It was a way of the comfort, but also it hit a lot of fash uh, body flaws. Right. a taffeta evening dress and the tiered dress which you will see he did later in the, his 1960s when he revived the 1920s look. Again, it'll look completely different later than it does at this time. Now, what also he designed 
ostrich capes to, for his shows. And what he did is the model would go down the runway, they would open up the cape, and there'd be a wow under it. In this case was a halter, black bias wool, dress. And this would be a shock to the audience and they'd gasp. Uh, if you notice, the cut on this dress, the neckline is plunging to the waist, but you'll also notice he always made sure the breast was totally covered. If you look on the halter part, it's cut high and under the arm so the side of the breast is not revealed. The straps in the back are for support for the bodice. Right. Uh, this many designers didn't do, they just cut. Again, a woman would feel safe, comfortable. She could also wear a strapless bra, a strapless bra under it. Uh, he was concerned about all these things. In 1960, uh, Anthony Trainer retired and d died shortly after. Uh, Norell had two investors who put him into business. He had 51% uh, of the stock and total freedom to do what he wanted. So by this time, he had total control of his technique. Right. The couture part and the understanding of mass production. Now the chapter that I considered the most important uh, is what I called What Made Norell's Clothes So Special, which I'll read. Most designers are good at designing only one thing like evening clothes or day clothes, coats and suits, dresses, or vice versa, but they couldn't do both. Norell was brilliant at designing both. He had perfect taste in all areas, design, fabrication, construction, tailoring, and fit. Overall, the years working, he uh, concentrated on the construction of his garments. At Hardy Carnegie, he examined the finest French couture garments. And uh, from the 1920s until 1940, he learned couture techniques that made his clothes different from 7th Avenue designers. He learned mass production from Train in 1941 to 1960. So by 1960, when he went into his own business, he was well-rounded in all areas of production, fit, and inner construction of his designs. His clothes were the equal of Paris couture, but were mass-produced, not made to measure, like in Paris. You could look inside his clothes and the inside was as beautiful as the outside. Once a woman put on his dresses, he became, she became devoted to his clothes for life. They were so comfortable. Norell took his fit models and had them reach, bend, sit, move around, and make sure the garment fit perfectly and was comfortable. The translation in the finished garment for a woman was perfection. So his customers were, the clothes were not binding, they could move freely. Again, he was a stickler for comfort. The most important thing for Net Norell was fit and construction, and that's why his sell-through in stores was so high. He gave his famous chemise dresses to only one pattern maker because he understood knits, how to achieve a perfect shape and fit. All seams were two inches or more. Today, high price lines give no seam allowance uh, to save money. Norell never did this. Pants were fully lined so the knee and the seat did not bag out and the pants kept their shape. Today, the only, they only line the front if they do that much. Also, it's to save money. Uh, Norell never skimped on inner construction and that's why his clothes were the equal of any from Paris. His clothes were made just like the French couture, but were mass-produced. 
lots of hand sewing, which you don't find in high end 7th Avenue even. All linings and facings were of the finest quality, be it hair armo, used for jackets and coat constructions. His double faced satin dresses and jackets were fully lined in silk organdy to give body and keep their, sh to keep their shape. Uh, the organdy cost as much as $15 a yard. This is in the 60s. 7th Avenue designers would use fabrics like this for a whole garment, not for hit being hidden inside a garment. He used different weights of organdy for blouses. He, the facings were lighter. Then he would line a dress with a heaven, heavier organdy. He did not care what it cost, and that's why today, more than 50 years later, his garments look as good today as they did when first made. Norell's wool jersey blouses had facings, facings of organdy down the front where the buttons are and across the yoke in the back and he would cover the back yokes with silk. This also gave body to the garment but it also prevented the knits from stretching. Uh, then he cut silk to cover the blou uh, blouses as I said in the back. Um, all seams were bound in silk or chiffon. If he did a tweed, he would bind it in a silk. Uh, for his blouses, if they were silk or chiffon, he did French, uh, uh, where you turn the fabric and stitch it so there'd be no raw seams. When he did chiffons, though, he would leave raw seams so there'd be no bulk. But what he did, he would pass a stitch near the edge so when the chiffon frays, it doesn't go past the stitching. In your exhibition in February, uh, I gave one of my mother's uh, 1950s black chiffon two pieces, a boat neck, long sleeve, a uh, low neck line in the back, and a circular skirt. And if you look inside, you'll see the chiffon, it's two layers. The inside is raw. It's just with a stitch. Um, Norell always wanted his clothes to be light and not heavy or bulky. He also used silk chiffons for pipings when needed. Uh, when he designed chiffon dresses, he would take the chiffon and hang it before cutting it so all the stretch would come out of it. Uh, otherwise, you'd have problems. Uh, when the garment got home, it would stretch out of shape. He also, chiffon is very hard to sew, so he would stitch it with tissue paper. Oh, wow. So you get flat seaming, and then you would remove the tissue paper. And of course, this only brought up the cost of right. the garment, of the ma making of the garment, because this is extra work and time consuming. Norell's coats and suits were lined in silk satin or taffeta. On coats, the hems had hair armo on the bias around them, and it was never pressed, so it would look soft and rounded. Linings and facings were kept light by using different weight fabrics. This helped keep the shape of the garment that Norell wanted. Inner construction is the secret of his clothing. A dress, suit, or coat was not a success unless a woman could move and stretch and feel good. Full skirts were lined in taffeta to keep it flared out. A slim skirt was lined in a soft silk crepe. Uh, when Norell used a vicuna fabric by a-G-A-N-O, an Italian uh, fabric house. This was, at the time, the most expensive fabric in the world. They only produced 800 yards a year because they got the raw material from Peru. Right. Um, when he would stitch a skirt in this and he would char it, he would on the inside put up just a strip of silk and when it would be shirred it would keep it f even keep it and nice. not uh, skew. Right. 
uh, he only used silk thread because it was strong and very soft. He didn't use uh, cottons or um, polyesters in the 60s. Um, again, it cost $100 a yard, which was then the most expensive fabric you could buy. Uh, he used uh, large hooks to keep skirts closed. All his zippers were hand set. The skirt shirring he shirred with a piece of silk. He used, as I said, only silk for his uh, stitching. To Norel, Norel was a perfectionist when it came to the finishing of a garment. Uh, American D Seventh Avenue designer firms didn't go to the extent. The samples were made the way Norel made his stock. But the cost, of course, was great, and these made Norel's clothes the most expensive on Seventh Avenues. A little knit chemise dress at the time of his death was the least expensive, was about $500 and up. This was the least expensive garment, and it went up to $5,000 for a beaded gown. All Norell's findings were imported from France, large hooks, uh, snaps uh, were bought in Paris, and he always covered them in silk. He used large hooks and eyes for his uh, skirts, for jackets, the backs of dresses. Necklines were very important to Norrell. In the 1920s, one of the main designing points, which he didn't believe in, was how do you make different necklines. He believed in a simple jewel neckline, period. Um, he also, uh, over the years, favored Peter Pan collars pussycat bows on his blouses, uh, a shang sam, which is a high banded collar taken from a Chinese shang sam dress, turtlenecks on his dresses and blouses. Necklines on Norel's world famous little black wool dresses were always, he always covered the clavicle bones because it's not the most flattering part of a woman's body. He would always dip the back of his neckline slightly to elongate a woman's neck in the back. Uh, when making a sleeveless dress, he would cut the fabric to the edge of the shoulder and face it in organdy for softness, but also to give coverage to a woman's arm. He would cut the armhole very high as to cover uh, oh, the fleshy part of a woman's arm. This was one of his secrets. Um, again, his little black dresses of the 60s he had made in the 50s in brocades. But in the 60s he found it was too passe and too formal, so he did little black dresses in soft, um, spongy wools and he was considered the best uh, at designing these of anybody in the world and these became his second bestsellers after his sh knit chemise dresses. He went on to design throughout the years one-shouldered dresses uh, and halter necklines. Um, the secret of his one-shouldered dresses, he cut it very high across the che chest and high under the armhole. What he also would do, sometimes put a jewel strap on the side that uh, to help support the bodice again of the dress. He would also show sometimes one-sided with a long sleeve. He did this in the 50s and he did it through the 60s. Norell on his jersey dresses quite often uh, would put a contrasting buttonhole, say a black dress with a red uh, buttonhole for the contrast. It gave a little detail. All his buttonholes were done by hand, never by machine. Belts were made by Ben King. Uh, they were all made by hand. He used belts as wide as fist five inches and very narrow in leather, suede, reptiles, and self-fabrics. And he often used on uh, self-fabrics, say on a skirt of a suit, 
he would stitch it with channel stitching, which is rows and rows and rows of stitching. This was one of his trademarks. On uh, simple sashes, he would quite often line the part that went around the back in a soft kid. Mm. And then in the front, it would tie into a bow, but it would have body and it would sit at a woman's waistline. Buttons were all imported from France and he used jewel buttons that cost five dollars each and he would use them massively. No concern for cost. Uh, all the buttons were um, baked in France to the colors that he was using for that season. Um, Uh, I did that. For evening gowns that were beaded were done in Norell's own factory. He had a factory on 16th Street. His famous mermaid dresses, each sequin was stitched one by one thousands. Each sequin had either two stitches or three stitches uh, to keep them in place. He would uh, stitch them onto silk jersey, wool, jersey dresses and chiffons and silk crepes and organdy. One dress he had graduated sequins and out of each sequin one ostrich feather. Uh, this was true couture. Yeah, of course. Uh, Norell used sequins, bugle beads, rhinestones on his gowns. Norell used the finest trimmings uh, that he could find. He used sable, mink, fox for the edges of his jackets, his coats, and borders on his evening skirts. You know. uh, they were supplied by David Goodman. Um, all of Norell's garments were underpressed in the factory. Now this was to prevent the, st the, the seam showing on the outside of the garment. This was done on all uh, samples in sample rooms, but nobody on 7th Avenue did this for stock. But this also was a way of uh, preventing the garment from looking not as good as it could. Um, Manufacturers tried to copy him but could not achieve similarities. Fabrics, weight, facings, and linings could not be duplicated. These were the secret of Norell's garments. His inner construction only with fabric, uh, fa constructions along with fabrics gave the shape and this could not be copied. They copied only a pattern of the dress which basically does not look like a Norrell. So there was really no competition in the knockoffs of his garments and uh, Seventh Avenue. Norrell's secret was his fit and construction and the perfection of a pattern to achieve the perfect garment, cut and proportion. This set his uh, clothes apart from anybody in America and even many of Europe's top couturiers didn't make garments as well as he did, even though his were mass-produced. Norell had favorite bodies, as I've expressed uh, in the past, and he would update them. The secret of Norell's chemise was not just two side seams down. It always hit a woman's bust, breast, hips, and then it would slightly taper. Mm -hmm. So it didn't look like a sack. Again, here's a picture of uh, 1961, yeah. a jersey one-shouldered gown. And again, if you notice, the high across the chest um, of the neckline, which made it very um, popular and a very good seller, because many one-shouldered dresses at, at that period did not sell because it didn't flatter a woman's body. It bulked over their breasts. On the other side, it was bulky. And Norell knew the secret of how to do this. Norell disliked tight clothing, like in the 1950s. 
he said it looks like hell because they would ride up it, it didn't give with the body. It did what it wanted to do. It didn't flow with the body. Um, all his clothes were made to flatter a woman's body and to hit the perfect spot to enhance the body and also to camouflage figure flaws. At times he would belt his chemises, as I said, uh, the chemise from 1940 on was his bestseller. Uh, next bestsellers were his little black dresses in the 60s. They were a uniform. They went from day into evening. Um, now in 1963-64 he did a smashing collection of Racine was the uh, French textile firm. These are, all his jerseys were double knits which had body. But he would still line them quite often in organdy and then a silk lining, crepe lining. He did a collection of this year in shocking pink. He did uh, chemises, again, one would be a v-neck, so he would outline rows of, like a tennis sweater, of mock diamonds, but in the shocking pink. He did the same thing at the bottom, he would have a border of the mock diamonds. Uh, and he did a whole grouping of this, and they were a smash, and they retailed for about six, seven hundred dollars because of the uh, the stones. Now what he did do, the stones were like nail heads. So on the backing, uh, the other side of the knit would be organdy, mm -hmm. which would then prevent the uh, knit from stretching out because these st the beading was very heavy. Um. We have about 15 minutes. Oy. Okay. Uh, again, the mermaid dresses were a big influence that uh, he did from the 30s on. Um, again, as I said, most of the bodies that we were talking about, he uh, repeated, repeated. Every garment was first made in muslin, and then his fit model would uh, try them on to see that the fit was perfect. Then he would hand it uh, to, uh, after the, the muslin was perfected, he would cut it in the fabric that he desired and it was given to a sample hand to stitch up. After it was finished, he would then have the model try it on again and have her move, sit and see for the comfort. If it didn't work, he would then recut the dress in a different fabric or completely discard the, the, the dress. Norel, uh, I had perfect patterns for sleeves, jackets, collars, blouses, the chemises, and they're called slopers. These are cardboard uh, patterns. Uh, so when he would make a new line, he didn't have to start from scratch. He could use what he had. Uh, Norell did not sell a summer line because he was so expensive, but one of his best specialty stores was Martha here in New York on Park Avenue, and she had a store in Palm Beach. So uh, her clients with the warm weather in Florida wanted basically some of things. So what he did, he would take his best bodies from the fall line, put them into Moreau, Moreau, Moreau linens uh, for day, and also he would bead them for evening. And that's how he started making uh, summer, uh, summer, and it also had his factory work longer because he usually had to close his factory. Uh, okay. Now, in 1963, Norell hired Max Berenager, a 30-year-old who had 
was a textile salesman uh, from Switzerland for Forster Willie Fabric Houses. Uh, he worked with Foy Norrell from 63 to 67. He was really a production man, even though Norrell was the production man. Um, what he had Norrell do, he had Norrell pre-cut before orders came in, like his little knit, knit, knit chemises. This enabled them to ship one month earlier. Long, there'd be a longer selling season in the stores. They shipped 1,200 more pieces by 1964-65. 70% more coats, suits were shipped, all done in the same number of workers. Uh, in the past, Norrell laid off his help two to three months a year. Now his factory worked 12 months of the year. He had 100 workers, cutters, pattern makers, sewers in a 16th Street factory. He shipped now 350 pieces of daytime jersey dresses, 70 to 100 three-piece wool costumes, 75 pieces per color of belted coats, 100 pieces of his little black dresses, 10 to 20 floor-length beaded gowns that wholesale from $16 to $1,700 wholesale. By fall 1964, his business increased by $1 million. This man made a major impact on his business. But it's amazing he only had 100 people working in his factory also. Yeah, but you have to remember, he, um, it would take a man one week to make a jacket. Mm -hmm. Now, mass production by the 60s, one person would set the sleeve, another one would set the collar. So more than one worker made a jacket. Norrell had one man do the whole Thing, so it would take a week. A girl could do maybe two dresses a week only because of the construction. Also, uh, if it was a light colored thing, you had to be very careful right. uh, for dirt. Most manufacturers would not make anything white because by the time it got to the store, it was dirty. Uh, 1963, Norell made his first jumpsuit in silk crepe. Um, okay. Okay. Here, 1963, is one of his famous little black dresses. It retailed for five hundred dollars. This is the Ampere gown that I was talking about, and here's a swatch of the fabric, the lame. Here's another, a tunic, but a little black dress. Here's an Ampere dress, and as you see, there's a shorter dress under it and a contrast in color. He did sportswear he, way before anybody else, basically, even though they were sold as a unit. Here you have a silk crepe blouse, a hand-knit silk sweater, belted, and a wool skirt. And this sold for about $7.50. But he was making separates again. Here, 63, his little waistcoat with a polka dot silk blouse and a simple skirt. Again, it is basically, and this was, it became a uniform of that period. Th th these were about $600 retail. Here you have his sailor dress mm -hmm. with a lace collar. He did them in satin, all satin, again, as one-piece dresses belted later. Here, 1961, you have a brocade skirt, a silk jersey top, and a satin bow. Again, this was influenced from the 30s on till his last collection. Something Norell was not known for particularly, but when he did it, they were quite beautiful. 1959, a trainer Norell, a chiffon. Again, I explained how they were made. Hmm. In 19, when he went into his own business in 1960, he made a revolutionary line 
His suits were culottes, which had never been done. No skirts. He made two variations. One slightly flared and when closed you couldn't tell the difference. It looked like a skirt. He also did one like a shirt sleeve straight, which really looks like a, a Bermuda short today. Again, here would be 1960, one of his famous mermaid gowns. Again, here 1961, a little black wool dress. Dinah Shaw wore this. It's a cut uh, velvet pants out with sable trim, harem pants. He knew how to put on a show also. Yes, for sure. Here's an evening suit with frog clothes. And again, you can see the, uh, the beautiful tailoring. Here's a simple slip dress mm -hmm. in wool knit. Retailed for about $3.95 at the time. He did this over and over. 1962 was a big collection. He introduced for the first time men, men's tailored robes for women in brocades. And he did these throughout again, and even on his last line. They retailed for about $1,500 wow. and they sold. Sequin tights to look like medieval armor. Okay. This was revolutionary and the most copied suit, 1962. Again, here's his little bolero with a very wide belt with a pussycat bow blouse. It's a fi uh, four, fi 14, um, what do you call it, <laughs> gauze, and he used 15 yards of fabric. And it was a smash. Every junior house copied it. In Europe, they copied it. Also, what I forgot to mention, the culotte he made, he was the first. A few years later, five French couturiers were making culottes. He also, at the time, had the perfect pattern. He offered to any American manufacturer that wanted to make a culotte, he offered to give his pattern to them. Over the year, he made uh, the very f full skirts uh, for a few years, but he downsized the fabrication because it was really a lot of fabric. Right, right, right. He did the same thing uh, as a uh, two-piece. He would do the gourd skirt with a silk pleated blouse, mm -hmm. belted, and with a stole for daytime wear. Uh, can we do more another time? <laughs> Chiffon harem. Really beautiful. Yeah. So my understanding is he, so he started, he went on his own as Norrell in 1960, and then he wrapped up his business in 1970 or 1971? No, he died, uh, he had a stroke in 1972. Okay. Um, that was his last collection. He had made about 16 pieces for holiday. It was a fall line into holiday. Uh, bon Wattella's president, Mildred Custon, suggested that Gus Tissell take over as designer for the house. He did come in and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. Within uh, two seasons, the firm closed. Nobody could replace him. 
Right, right. And he had a stroke, unfortunately, just a few days before, before his retrospective yeah, at the Costume yeah, Institute. Yeah. And he was unfortunately never able to attend or anything. But he did select the clothes that went into the show, okay. the 50 uh, uh, or so garments that were at the Met. Uh, he borrowed again, as I said. Then there was a fashion show from his clients, which was in addition to what was on exhibition. This was a, pri a private uh, for the patrons. Mm -hmm. um, again, nobody has come near him since. He, again, he was considered the Balenciaga of his time because of his selection of fabrics. All the textile people believed they would select the same fabrications each season right. unknowingly. Uh, he came out with a pea jacket in the early 60s in shocking Scaparelli pink and put it over a little black dress. He was the first to really do separates. His last line, he did most of the fabrics were from Italy, from Agnona, A-G-A-N-O. I don't pronounce it correctly. Um, the fabrics were uh, alpacas, blends of vicuna and alpaca, wool and alpaca. He would do a, a plaid shirt jacket mm -hmm. with a plain skirt with a turtleneck sweater. It was really sportswear. He said he knew that fashion was becoming less, much more casual. And he was, again, if you took his last line, the last few lines, and took the pieces, you could wear them with your own a blouse, a different jacket. It was interchangeable, but it was sold at this point still as a one-unit garment. Mm -hmm. uh, in the late 60s, uh, there was a trim, when they brought in the midi, about 67, 68, it was a flop and it hurt the garment industry, but also economically the country was in a very bad position. And at this point Norell was very expensive and his people were also concerned about uncontrolled prices. He brought in Ben Shaw, who was a dress manufacturer and an interpreter, to try to bring down the cost of his uh, production. Unfortunately, he tampered with Norell's inner construction and the clothes did not look like what Norell expected and the relationship ended. But he did uh, put controls in the factory that did bring down the cost. Mm -hmm. But again, his simple little, uh, previously uh, a little wool jersey dress when he opened would be about 250 It had gone up to now. $500 and it was escalating from late 60s till his death it was about $500 mm -hmm. again so he had much more control of the price and as I see he said the women were becoming less concerned about clothing the younger generation were not taking after the parents they didn't change their clothes twice three times a day as they had done previously and he realized, and he said, it was, he was not going to change. Right. And uh, like other designers that were very high end, the demand started to shrink. He passed away before what he already said was going to happen. His business was going to shrink. He yeah. knew it. And this is, of course, the exact same time period when all of the high-end custom salons, like the Bergdorf Goodman Custom Salon and, and um, B. Altman and some of these, their custom salons were also closing because of this exact same reason. It's just the customer the design base of, the was design alon, The designer salons were shrinking. Yeah. They worked with a very few what top designers, like a Galanos was the next one near Norel mm -hmm. in uh, price, and con uh, but he was mo really known for evening clothes more than day clothes, but he made the best chiffons in the world. Uh, uh, Jeffrey Bean, uh, Montesano and Puzan, Ben Zuckerman, for those two for coating, coats and suits, um, Bill Blass, uh, Pauline Trigere, mm -hmm. who also had worked at uh, Hattie Carnegie and... Uh, Everybody worked for Hattie at one point. Well, Hattie, Hattie she was, uh, but she was there just uh, uh, what do you call it, the war period, and she went into her own business. But uh, well, they, they were like the Bergdorfs of yeah. the day. Uh, these 
designers uh, were the ones that the designer salons, but they didn't buy much uh, stock like they had previously. Again, but Norel uh, sell through was so high that up until his death, they didn't cut him his uh, their stock buying from him too radically, but they didn't buy more than one or two pieces of a, a size range, right. or they would have him come and do uh, showings like at Bonwitz and then the people would order, special order the things. They didn't want to gamble on carrying stock. So that did diminish. And then as, as stores started going out of business later, there was less outlets for high-end clothing. Mm -hmm. Well, and speaking of stock, you brought an extra show and tell. I'm going to reach over. I'll, you stay there. Okay. I'll come over and grab the garment. This is uh, 1960. Three. This is from Woman's Wear Daily, drawing by Kenneth Paul Block, who was basically the best. Norell gives the world a new suit look with a new proportion. It's high up, up in front with back dip and the fully gathered new skirt with a demure silk blouse. A great suit from a fashion great. For more on Norell's collection, you see page four and five. Again, if you notice, on the sleeve, all buttonholes were functional. They were made to work. No fake buttonholes. If you see the dots here, comes down. A seasoned lady, he moved the dart up here to come down. He, and he put two buttons. Again, the taffeta linings. The back dart, there's a very heavy, about this big, metal disc set up to keep the jacket down in the back. Here's the dirndl skirt and here's a channel stitching on the belt rows and rows of stitching. The skirt, if you see the fabric, is all, it's not bonded, but there is uh, uh, in the weave a heavy, heavy uh, wool. The seams here are very uh, over two inches. Uh, the fa it's pinked so it wouldn't unravel. Again, you can hear the taffeta, which gives the skirt the flare in the body. Again, here's the back. And in here are two very heavy weights. What he also would do, he would put chains and stitch them in, uh, uh, cover them in the taffeta and put them at the bottom of jackets depending on the style. And the blouse next. Sure. Down, yeah. Uh, this is a uh, Abraham eight ply silk crepe blouse that went under it, and if you see, he followed the same cut of the jacket. And as I said, the next season he raised the dart up here. Now what you'll see is a turtleneck rolled and inside is organdy. He also did this as a blouse. The, he turned the collar around. This would be the front of a blouse. So uh, again, buttonholes all done by hand. all stitched by hand, the armhole. Almost as lovely on the inside yeah. as on the outside. Again, you'll see the bias, organdy, on the yoke. And then you have the, fa the facing to cover it. Again, where the buttonholes, as I explained before, is bias, organdy as well. Again, all hand stitched. Nobody on 7th Avenue did this. Only he did it. Again, uh, this is the secret to his garments and that's why here, this is uh, three, four, five, six, fifty-five 55 years ago.
old and it still looks as good as yeah, when it was does. made then. And this is why women collected, his clientele's collected, and he never lost his clientele. Uh, as you'll read, uh, my manuscript, no, it's all right. Yeah. My manuscript, uh, I go into much more detail than what the time permitted here. And again, as you can see, you, I gave also the best to the years of his collections for photographs, which they're with all. my descriptions as well. Mm -hmm. And they're all processed? Your whole manuscript collection yeah. is processed? Yeah. All archived and all um, archival go. boxes ready to go. So anyone hearing this oral history, please know that we have all these additional materials that Mr. Ames And there are swatches well. attached to a lot of the things that I had. As I said, uh, I used to go to the sample room. Right. And I used to see from A to Z from, from the the, from, from the muslin to the finished garment. Well, I just want to say thank you so very much. We are unfortunately out of time for this particular oral history, but again, the second time, this was amazing. So thank you so very much for lending us your time and your memories and your thoughts and your insights. It was my pleasure.